Tani Utakiri for Labour. Come up, sir. Round of applause, please. Help yourself to a glass of water, sir, oh. if you would like. And I will set my timer so that we do not go over time. No unfair advantages. How's the campaign been going, Tangy? Very positive. Very, Very positive. positive? Yep. Yeah, cool. Um, I, we have noticed in the last year or so of the, the, the Labour-led government, when ministers leave, portfolios seem to be added on to existing people. There seems to be a lack of skill base in the current Labour Party for new people to come forward. Is that going to be a little bit career limiting for you? I don't think so. I think the reality is Labour is a diverse church and with that come many individuals who have lots to offer. Um, and part of my focus on this campaign is going out to this electorate, uh, sharing with electors that I have a skill set that I think would be very valuable um, as a member of the Labour caucus, but also in Parliament and in government. Um, you've been quite the advocate for social housing in government. Uh, will you be an advocate for state housing uh, as an MP for Palmerston North if you're successful? Well, I think my party has a track record of delivering in that space. I mean, um, my own background in terms of as a member of the local council, it's a council that still invests and is a part of social housing. So I would see that as part of my natural DNA in terms of what I bring and how I represent uh, people in the city. And what does that mean for a track record that comes to Kiwi Build and the lack of that traction? Look, I, I think um, you know we haven't made uh, any excuses around around Kiwi Build. It's not worked out the way that we thought it would. We have had to have a reset. We have. Um, the fact is, actually, when we're looking at social and public housing in this city, for the first time in 25 years, uh, we've seen the first state house, public house, social house being built by a Labour-led government. That is just a start. <laughs> But that's the tip of the iceberg, isn't it? And it's not unique to this electorate either. Housing is a New Zealand-wide... I think the term crisis has been used more than once. Absolutely. I mean, I think you could ask anyone and they would tell you that we need more houses. The reality is, actually, if we had delivered the amount of houses that we had uh, over the last three years, over the last ten years, we would actually not be in the situation that we would be now. Uh, a Labour-led government's proposing to get rid of the Provincial Growth Fund, I understand. Well, I think it's, it's fair to point out that the Provincial Growth, growth Fund was time-bound. That was a particular fund that had a beginning and end date. Uh, what we've decided is uh, to look at actually what are the next steps. And the next steps are around working with regions around regional economic development and the plans for different reason, regions will be obviously depending on the strengths of, of those areas and we think that's actually where the next step and where the focus needs to lie. So, it, uh, to, by extension, do you think the Provincial Growth Fund was ineffective or unsuccessful? No, look, I think the Provincial Growth Fund, certainly for this city, has delivered uh, fantastic outcomes when we look at $4.7 million towards Stage 2 of Papaioia House, that's social housing. When we look at the $40 million um, allocation for the Kiwi Rail Distribution Hub, which plays to our strengths uh, as, as an electorate and as a city and as a region, I think it's had its time, it's had its place, it has stimulated growth. It has stimulated uh, job opportunities in this region and in other provinces up and down the country. Does it, so it needs to change to a, a regional approach then? Why can't it stay as a provincial fund? Well, our focus is on looking at that regional level moving forward. Uh, the reality is that with the PGF now we have a stimulation in the region that will create jobs, will create much needed assistance and support around infrastructure needs for regions. And so for us it's actually looking at how we can move that to the next step. Economic development and its planning, that's where we think that the advantages lie. Mm. Uh, it goes with a uh, saying, I think, for most people in this audience, they'll know uh, you're wearing two hats at the moment because you are still technically Deputy Mayor of Palmerston North. Uh, and I understand you've been uh, returning your, your salary during the campaign period. I have. Uh, from the moment I was selected, I have uh, donated or returned my Deputy Mayor's salary, my full council salary actually, um, to the Mayoral Relief Fund. Uh, that's not quite going to offset the uh, cost of a by-election, though, is it? Look, I think there's, there's no doubt, obviously, if I was elected as the next MP for Palmerston North, that there will be a by-election. Um, when I went to the 
the ratepayers and residents in October last year. I had no uh, well, I had no uh, suggestion that I would be running for Parliament. Actually, ten weeks ago, I had no suggestion that or belief that I would be the candidate here in Palmerston North. Circumstances, as we all know, uh, have changed. Um, I think actually that what Palmerston North needs is a strong local voice. I'm putting myself as that option, the viable option. Um, the other thing, of course, is that the the electors in Palmerston North are also ratepayers, so they will have that as part of their consideration. But if they feel that I'm the best person for the job, then they will vote uh, for me at the upcoming election. The other thing I would say is the reason why there would be an election is because I'm not a fan of double dipping, and the fact is to um, why I'm returning my deputy mayoral salary is around that as well. But I would look to resign, resign as soon as possible. Um, I'm not on the Labour Party list, so the only way that I will make it to Parliament is as the Member of Parliament for Palmerston North. And so I leave that decision up to the electors in the city. I was going to say, because th this is not the first time this has happened in recent history, and the voter appetite <coughs> for a by-election straight after a general election is not strong, is it? I mean, would it be uh, reflective, would the voter base sufficient, be sufficient to be reflective of the community to bring in another councillor after a general election? I think the, the, the reality is that um, electors have a choice. If they believe that I am the best person to be their local member of parliament, they know that that will result in a by-election because I'm not going to do dual roles. Um, that is effectively a choice that is in their hands. And just not pressing the point too hard, but the, the, the discussion of rates post-COVID, rates, budgets are tight, that we were trying not to increase rates too much because of COVID. This is an unbudgeted cost for the council and it's not an inconsiderable amount of money. Jimmy, I don't know if you can fact check me on this, but there were notions of up to $80,000 potentially for a by-election. Um, can you justify that in your own head? Well, I think the reality is if there is a by-election, again, it goes back to voter choice. Um, I wholeheartedly, in good faith, went to my um, community back in October. Um, you know, look, I've only, what, a matter of three weeks before selection was uh, a new commissioner with the Criminal Cases Review Commission. So it's not as if this was something that I had kept hidden from uh, the electorate. It may be an opportunity, actually, if a by-election does result for the council to think whether they can use that opportunity to perhaps elicit some information around feedback or response if there's going to be a by-election. I'm not talking about a poll or anything, but mm -hmm. it might just be a little bit of lateral thinking where if the opportunity is there, um, it's one that the council could consider to take up if it so chooses. Um, do you mind if I jump in just with a question from uh, people watching or, or perhaps here, I'm not quite sure. Um, someone's just asking candidates, what, if you were part of a government, what policy sort of portfolio would you be interested in? Oh look, I think fundamentally for me it's about representing this community. That's what I'm campaigning for um, and I believe that the best way that I can do that is a member of, of the Labour team. Um, and Labour and Government obviously is, um, is the top option as I see it. So I would be fundamentally number one in terms of portfolio and priority is actually to the city and to this electorate. Um, if the, the leader of the party, the caucus, the Prime Minister, whoever wished that there was a particular role um, that I could play, I'd be happy to do so. Very quickly, just quick fire, uh, we have referenda as well. Uh, do you support the cannabis legalisation and control? Yes, I do. Do you support the end of life choice? No, I don't. Uh, and can you speak to Reo or, or can you demonstrate sign language? Um, I can do a little bit of both. In terms of Tereo, I can introduce myself. I'm pretty comfortable in terms of Tereo Māori. In terms of sign, I can introduce myself as well. Do you want me to do that now? You can do it if okay. you wish, yeah. Uh, kia ora koutou, ko tangi utikiri taku ingwa, ko puta maunga ko namuta awa, ko ngati puti kati te iwi, no aite takiahau, ko au te uh, mema o te raupu reipa, uh, tēnā tātou katoa. So I'm Tangi Utikiri, member of the Labour Party. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sir?